Hey guys, welcome back to Functional PCOS. Today we're going to be talking about the three root cause issues in PCOS. Knowing your root causes can really help you to target and identify where you need to change your nutrition and lifestyle to better manage your PCOS symptoms. I'm Amber. I'm a certified nutrition specialist specializing in PCOS nutrition. I've been doing this for the last decade and I also have PCOS so I can understand a lot of the unique experiences that we go through as women with PCOS and trying to manage this condition. On this channel, we discuss PCOS nutrition and I try to give you practical tips from a functional nutrition standpoint to help you manage your condition better. So if that sounds good to you, feel free to like and subscribe and come back for more videos. The information that we talk about today is purely for educational and informational purposes. Please always consult with your doctor, with your specialists to make sure that anything that we talk about is right for you. So let's get into today's topic. Now, first, before we talk about what the three root cause issues are, we have to understand what I mean when I say root causes, because the true root cause of PCOS is really unknown. PCOS is a syndrome, and whenever we call something a syndrome, it tends to mean that we don't fully understand it. And in the case of PCOS, a lot of what's going on is that we don't have a specific gene or a specific life process that happens that creates PCOS. It can come from a lot of different places, and there are a lot of different factors involved. But when I talk about root causes, I'm talking about the root issues that drive symptoms in PCOS. So once a person already has PCOS, there are these three underlying issues that can create symptoms. And so many of us are dealing with one or two or possibly even all three of them without realizing it. If we know what these are, we can do a much better job of managing our nutrition appropriately and actually getting some results. So these three root issues are insulin resistance, chronic inflammation, and adrenal dysfunction. So I'm gonna go into each one, talk a little bit about what it is, how it works, and some of the symptoms that are associated with it. And I'd love for you to follow along. Let me know what resonates for you, if you feel like any particular root cause sounds the most like you, or if you feel like you have a combination of factors, or if you're confused, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Let's start with insulin resistance because this is probably the most common root cause issue in PCOS. And there is a collection of people with PCOS who only deal with insulin resistance, at least at first. So insulin resistance is when our bodies become resistant to the signals of insulin. Whenever we eat a food, and this is mostly happening in foods that contain carbohydrates. So any of your um, starches, grains, vegetables, anything like that, you're going to eat it. It's going to break down in your stomach and it's going to be eventually taken and created into a fuel source called glucose. Now, glucose is just sugar, sugar that's in your blood. So as your body converts your food into glucose, your blood sugar levels rise. And it's important for your body to keep a nice equilibrium with your blood sugar because it can be dangerous for your blood sugar to be too low or too high. So what your body does is it uses a hormone called insulin to help shuttle that sugar into the cells so that the cells can use it for energy. What happens in the case of insulin resistance is that the body becomes resistant to that signal from insulin. So those cells stop listening and they don't open their doors. And in order for the body to stay in a safe equilibrium, it really does need that blood sugar to come down. So the pancreas reacts by making more insulin and pumping more out so that the body will have to listen to that signal. Unfortunately, those high levels of insulin are what then drive a lot of the hormone imbalances in PCOS because insulin directly works on your ovaries to help you create more testosterone. So many of the symptoms that you're probably experiencing, like irregular periods, facial hair, hair loss on the top of the head, uh, excess weight gain, things like that, can be attributed back to the fact that we have all these extra androgens, uh, which are male hormones, so things like testosterone. And that testosterone has to come from somewhere, and one of the main places that it comes from is this overproduction of insulin. Now, with insulin resistance, 
people tend to think that they only have it if they have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes. But there's actually a large group of folks with PCOS who have something called hyperinsulinemia. And I don't hear this talked about too much. So I like to mention it because it's what I dealt with as I was growing up. And I never thought that I had insulin resistance because my lab work always looked normal. But if you've ever had uh, something that we call reactive hypoglycemia or your blood sugar gets low between meals, then you may be dealing with something called hyperinsulinemia. And this is common in PCOS. It's when the body is pumping out excesses of insulin all the time. During your meals, you're making more insulin than the average person would, but you also are making enough insulin and your body is not quite so resistant to the signal from insulin that you are able to manage your blood sugar Overall, your body's able to get the sugar into your cells. And so on paper, it doesn't look like your blood sugar is getting too high or being too high over time. However, how that feels in the body is very different. It doesn't feel very good. And we'll talk about some symptoms in a minute. But in addition to that, it's not the blood sugar being volatile that creates more testosterone. It's the insulin itself. So having those excesses of insulin functions in much the same way as other forms of insulin resistance like prediabetes by having your body create all this extra. And since insulin is a hormone, it'll impact your other hormones. Now there's lots of symptoms of insulin resistance and I wanna go into some of the major ones. I've got my list here just to remind me because I don't wanna forget any of the really good ones. Uh, but the the one that I tend to ask about first is the one that I see the most common in folks who don't have any type of formal diagnosis for insulin resistance. And this is what I talked about before, that reactive hypoglycemia. So what will happen is maybe you eat a meal and if you notice that a couple hours after your meal, you might be feeling a little bit weak, shaky. Sometimes people feel nauseous, sweaty, or overly hot. Um, sometimes people feel fainty or like they need to eat a snack or they just get in a really bad mood and get a headache. So any of these can be signs that your blood sugar has gone too low and there's different severities of that. But the main point is that if you feel better when you eat, it's likely that your blood sugar had gotten too low to begin with. And the reason that the blood sugar gets low is because if you're pumping out a lot of extra insulin, insulin is eventually going to be able to do its job of bringing that blood sugar down and getting that sugar into the cells. So it's going to accidentally bring your blood sugar a little bit too low. And that's where you start to feel the symptoms because remember, like I said, the body has to keep the blood sugar in a nice, tight equilibrium. It can't be too high, can't be too low. So when it gets too low, your body sends signals to kind of get you to eat and it makes you feel better. Now, some other symptoms of insulin resistance can be related to having high blood sugar levels. So let's say after you eat a big meal, if you ever feel really tired after that or excessively thirsty, those can be signs that your blood sugar got too high. I know this is really common in people when they eat like a big meal, like Thanksgiving dinner, right? You might be feeling, a lot of people attribute it to the tryptophan and the turkey, but it's actually probably that our blood sugar gets really high after meals like that. And so our body's just like, whoa, let's rest, let's process. So if you are not eating a diet that's really balanced for your unique insulin needs, then what could be happening is that you could be accidentally having your blood sugar go too high after meals. And one thing that's really interesting about this is just how biochemically unique each person is. Because I obviously in 10 years of working as a nutritionist have worked with a very wide range of people. And I've seen a lot of data from things like continuous glucose monitors. And it is so interesting how one meal could affect one person one way and another person a different way, even within the confines of being someone who has PCOS. If you would like to try something like a continuous glucose monitor, I do have a uh, coupon code that you can use to try out a NutriSense monitor, which is the one that I used. And I had a really good experience about that. I'll also link to a um, podcast that I did with someone from NutriSense kind of about my experience if you're interested in that. So that'll be in the show notes below. So there could be some more subtle, longer term symptoms of insulin resistance that I think are interesting to talk about. If you deal with things like getting a lot of skin tags um, or if you get this dark, darkening velvety patches of skin in certain areas of the body. So this tends to happen in like the back of the neck, sometimes the elbows, armpits, um, and even sometimes on the knees. 
it's like a darkened velvety patch of skin around that area. And that is something called acanthosis nigricans. So acanthosis nigricans along with skin tags, both are can be symptoms of insulin resistance because insulin kind of creates these, it creates growth. And so sometimes certain areas of the body will excessively kind of create cells in response to insulin. And that's where we get some of these kind of unusual experiences. But another thing that happens frequently with folks who have um, insulin resistance is that if they get frequent UTIs, um, that can sometimes be a factor because the um, urinary environment gets out of whack from all that sugar being in the bloodstream. So there are some longer term things there that you might want to pay attention to, even if you don't think that you've got insulin resistance going on. And then the other thing that kind of exists across the spectrum of PCOS root causes is uh, weight gain in certain areas. So typically with insulin resistance, we'll have a lot of weight gain around the middle abdomen area, the stomach. And, uh, you know, this, uh, again, it can be some of the other root causes playing a factor here too. But what I notice with insulin resistance is that folks tend to have a lot of trouble with getting weight to budge in that particular area. So there will be this experience of like, if somebody's following a really, you know, specific plan with specific calories and macros and all that, they can get the needle to move, um, but they gain weight really easily. And so if they kind of are not, you know, perfect on this diet plan, they might find that they gain easy, they lose a little bit more, diff it's a little harder to lose. And so the progress can feel kind of stagnant over time if things aren't addressed properly. So this is, and then they'll notice that weight gain in the middle section of the abdomen. Now, the thing about insulin resistance is that it does tend to get worse as we gain weight. And this is one of those areas where you get almost stuck between a rock and a hard place with PCOS insulin resistance, because as you gain weight, you become more insulin resistant. As you become more insulin resistant, you have more cravings and you have more difficulty determining when you are full and when you're hungry. This is because of something called leptin resistance. So with leptin resistance combined with insulin resistance, we can get into this kind of cravings cycle that's difficult to break and makes a lot of this very murky, especially when it comes to eating healthy. The next root cause issue in PCOS is chronic inflammation. And inflammation can sometimes get a bad rap because it is, again, like the word, like the phrase root causes. It's one of those kind of buzzy words now where people use it a lot, but they're not really using it appropriately. But chronic inflammation is a real thing. And it's actually one of the foundations of a lot of modern health um, dysfunctions and diseases. So it's something that most people actually need to be paying more attention to and something that probably has its roots in a lot of systemic food issues in our society. However, when it comes to chronic inflammation and PCOS, what we're talking about here is not the kind of inflammation that would happen for example, if you broke a bone, you know how your body would kind of like swell up in that spot to sort of protect the injury. This is something that has no discernible source. So it's just kind of like all over the body. And the only way to really measure it is with these kind of like inconsistent measurements like um, high sensitivity CRP, which is a protein that the uh, a, a blood test for a protein that the liver produces in response to inflammation. So it's it's very murky. Like, where is this inflammation coming from? It's just kind of all over, and um, it has no discernible source. And that's what makes it different from acute inflammation. Now, in the case of PCOS, where the inflammation is coming from is a variety of different places. So from the choices that we make, there are, of course, some choices – with food that might be contributing in a negative way here. So packaged foods, processed foods, fried foods, foods that are high in advanced glycation end products, which are things that are very heavily grilled or caramelized. Those things can all contribute to the inflammation level in PCOS. And so there are foods that we can eat to offset those. There are foods that we should prefer more in the diet, which I can talk about another time. However, if you set the diet choices aside, there are some other places where inflammation can come from. So one of the big ones that I see is from gut health dysfunction. Our guts are really 
the root of a lot of our health. Uh, they're very foundational to the health of our body, probably superseded only by maybe the mitochondria in importance. The gut is a really, really important ecosystem. And inside of your gut are billions and billions of bacteria and other organisms that play a lot of different roles. They can actually alter the expression of our genetics, which is interesting. Um, they can change how insulin resistant we are, for example. And so they can play a role in a lot of your PCOS symptoms. Being inflamed can also create more testosterone in the body, which can then lead to a lot of those testosterone symptoms of insulin resistance that we talked about. So they can overlap there. Uh, the gut can play a role here because in PCOS, we do tend to have more imbalances than the average person. There's a lot of research pointing to gut health disturbances. We often call it dysbiosis in PCOS being one of those kind of root drivers of symptomology. So where I see this play out practically with people is that Having a dysfunctional gut microbiome can lead to difficulty metabolizing and excreting properly. So when we create hormones, um, they break down over time. A good example of this is that um, a lot of people don't know that we make estrogen from our testosterone. And so um, after we've converted our testosterone down the line and it's become, you know, what some form of estrogen metabolite, and then that gets processed down the line. Eventually, it has to be excreted and removed from the body. And when we have an, uh, an unbalanced gut, we can get more um, of these enzymes called beta glucuronidase enzymes that cause reuptake of um, estrogen metabolites. So that can contribute to more hormone dysfunction because it can start causing, you know, signs of estrogen dominance, which is another thing that is, you know, common in PCOS. It happens a lot. So, um, so we'll get issues with ex excreting and metabolizing. We'll also get issues with developing sensitivities. So I start to see a lot of people with a lot of immune responses to foods, um, inflammatory responses to certain foods because the gut microbiome has developed this unhealthy place and maybe they've started to get something that we call intestinal permeability or leaky gut. And then they start having immune reactions to certain foods and so suddenly certain things in their diet that maybe shouldn't be problematic, like dairy, start to become problematic because the person has started to develop these sort of immune reactions to foods. So it can become, you know, a cycle where then we ha start having digestive issues. Maybe we're having like diarrhea or constipation or GERD or acid reflux, and that is further setting off the balance of these bacteria. So the gut is a really important place, but it's also a really complex place. And I cannot do it justice in this video, but there's a lot to it and it really does play a big role in a lot of symptoms. So when I am thinking about inflammation as a main root cause, the questions I'm asking are about digestive health primarily because that's a good sort of indicator most of the time that there may be something going on. So I'm looking at things like um, what the bowel movements look like. I'm asking to see, you know, what they rate themselves on the Bristol stool chart. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen that, but it's something dietitians use to figure out if somebody's constipated or if they're having normal bowel movements. So I'm asking about their bowel movements. I'm asking about, you know, do they get reflux? Do they, um, have they had gastrointestinal infections like, you know, H. pylori or C. diff? Are they um, dealing with, have they ever had SIBO or do they suspect that they have SIBO, which is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? So I'm looking a lot at the function of the digestive system. And if there are a lot of imbalances there, then inflammation may be a big culprit in their PCOS symptoms because the hormones are sort of reacting to that environment. Now, I also will put a big focus on inflammation when a person has already an existing uh, autoimmune disorder. So if they have 
you know, rheumatoid arthritis or something like that, then I'm placing a larger focus on the gut because oftentimes autoimmune disorders are also connected to gut health issues and food sensitivity and allergy and things like that. So it's important to pay more attention there and it gets us further faster than just focusing on blood sugar. I'm also really looking for skin issues because skin issues can be a subtle sign that something's wrong in the gut, which a lot of people kind of, you know, it's hard to make sense of at first, but it, it, there is a lot of truth to that. When our body's detox systems are overwhelmed, our liver, our guts, when they're overwhelmed or they can't do their job properly, sometimes we will detoxify through the skin. So we may get more um, acne. Uh, and if it's not hormonally based uh, around a specific time of the month or, you know, something like that, it might be connected to potentially like some food sensitivity or allergy issues. Uh, eczema as well can be connected to gut health. And I definitely see a lot of improvement in eczema and rosacea when a person really focuses on their gut health. And then the last thing that I'm looking for as well is weight loss resistance or um, a certain like puffiness or easy weight gain. What I have noticed is that in my clients who want to lose weight, one of the things that they struggle with is they may do everything right, including eating a blood sugar friendly diet. You know, they're following all the rules and they're even exercising, but they're still having very, very stubborn weight loss resistance. And sometimes I find that this is connected to their gut health issues because when we are uh, weight loss resistant, sometimes what I think is happening is that the body doesn't feel safe to let go of weight. I always like to remember that body fat is really a safety mechanism. And in a lot of ways, our bodies are still very primal in that sense. So it's going to prefer to put on fat than, you know, to not have any fat at all. And so if a person is dealing with a lot of weight loss resistance, even when they're doing everything right, my thought process is, where is the body feeling unsafe? So could it be some stress or adrenal dysfunction issues? Possibly, but it could also be a type of uh, physiological stress related to inflammation, right? Maybe they have a really bad food sensitivity or an allergy that they're unaware of. I've seen that before. So those are things that I'm thinking about with inflammation. Inflammation is a complicated topic for sure. I think it's much more complicated than insulin resistance, but hopefully that gives you a little overview. And if some of those things ring true for you, then that may be something to, to look at. Now, the final root cause issue is adrenal dysfunction. And adrenal dysfunction is an interesting one because it is hard to pinpoint. And so many of the interventions for adrenal dysfunction don't have anything to do with what we eat, but more how we eat, when we eat, and um, the way that we're taking care of ourselves. So our self-care, our sleep, and things like that. So the adrenals are stress glands. They produce our stress hormones, but they're also really important for our energy. So one of the hormones that they produce is something called cortisol. And I think of cortisol as a stress and an energy hormone because what it's doing for us is it's helping us to be awake. It's helping us to have the energy to get through our day, but it's also something that we can pull on when we need an immediate boost of resources when our fight or flight mode gets activated. Cortisol is released on a rhythm, starts out kind of high in the morning, and then it goes down as the rest of the day goes on. And so as it goes down, we tend to get sleepier and eventually we go to bed. And along with some other hormones like melatonin and things like that, we create something called a circadian rhythm, which is balanced around the cycles of sunlight. Now, what happens in PCOS often is that these cycles get sort of off. And this can be a variety of things can, can contribute to this. Um, and, but the way it's experienced is that you may start developing a reverse rhythm where you're really awake at night. You're wired but tired, we would kind of say, but you have trouble falling asleep. Um, you have maybe trouble waking up or the opposite could be true. You know, you it's fine. You easily fall asleep, but you have trouble staying asleep. You know, if you wake up at 4 a.m. every day and you have trouble falling back asleep again, it could be your cortisol kind of out of whack there. And that can be a response to long-term stress. It can be a response to um, anxiety as well. So what I've noticed a lot with adrenal dysfunction 
is that it tends to be connected often to folks who do have anxiety, and that anxiety tends to be connected back to folks who have unresolved trauma. So we know that in PCOS, there are we do tend to have higher ACE scores, adverse childhood events scores. And I, my theory on this too is that things that happen to us, you know, maybe even as young adults, um, medical trauma and things like that can also contribute to this. But just for the purposes of talking about all of this, we'll talk about ACE scores. So when we have a higher ACE score, when we've experienced more trauma, it does tend to change our brains and to make it more uh, easy for us to produce stress hormones. So our bodies can get into that fight or flight mode a lot faster. And that's a survival skill, right? But unfortunately, in our modern day and age, our brains really have a lot of trouble determining what's a real threat and what's a perceived threat. And when you've had traumatic experiences, you become more vulnerable to stress, less resilient to stress. So let's say you and your friend who doesn't have any of this stuff going on, maybe get an email from the boss about a meeting that needs to happen. Your friend might feel a little nervous about it, but be able to kind of like wait and get there and, you know, wait to see what happens. But because you are more uh, vulnerable to that stress, you're less resilient to it. You, even though you may mentally be kind of talking yourself down and whatever, but your body may be experiencing those stress hormone surges in higher amounts or quicker or what have you. And over time, this can contribute to PCOS symptoms because when our body goes into that fight or flight mode, we tend to release uh, blood sugar back into our, we tend to really sugar back into our blood. We store some of that in our muscles and our liver. So when we release that sugar, our body has to pump out insulin to bring that down. And you can see how if insulin is a fat storage hormone, and if insulin is what kind of contributes to our testosterone rising, you can see how eventually that might become a problem because Now, all of a sudden, we are not just having insulin production when we eat, but also whenever we get a little stressed, nervous, anxious, what have you. So uh, this is why it's really important to practice mindfulness, self-care. This is why people are always talking about like meditation for PCOS and, you know, Uh, do some mindfulness practice, do gratitude journaling, go to therapy, what have you. A lot of people think, how is that connected to my PCOS, but this is how, because changing the way that you respond to stress um, by helping your nervous system to regulate more often will then change the way that your hormones are responding because you'll have fewer spikes of insulin and you'll be able to sleep better and that will reduce cravings and it all goes together. It's all systemic. So with, uh, That's cortisol. Now, there's another hormone called DHEA that is an androgen produced by the adrenals. And there are a lot of people with PCOS who actually don't have high testosterone but have high DHEAS. And um, DHEAS is an androgen, just like testosterone is an androgen. So you can get those same PCOS symptoms that you know and love from having high DHEAS. And DHEAS, since it's produced from the adrenals, tends to be connected to a lot of these adrenal issues and tends to be higher in folks who've kind of got long-term issues with adrenals. Um, Some symptoms of adrenal dysfunction, if you're thinking maybe this might be you, would be those sleep issues I talked about before. Another thing we'd want to look at is caffeine dependency. Moderation is key. So if you have a dependency on caffeine to the point where you really can't function without it, that's when it becomes a concern that it may be affecting your adrenals. And this is particularly the case if you've kind of gone through a time where, you know, maybe you were using caffeine in the afternoons to get by, and then now you've reached a point where, like, caffeine doesn't even do anything to you. So, yeah, with the adrenals, we're looking at things like sleep dysfunctions, you know, um, caffeine dependence. We're looking at trauma. We're looking at our anxiety and our reactions to different stuff. And if 
you tend to be more of a type A person or to struggle with some of that type of behavior, then it may be something to really look more into. All right, so those are the root cause issues in PCOS. I hope that was helpful. I know the question that you're probably having now is, okay, now I know all this, but what can I actually do about it? And that's a valid question and a valid concern. Uh, I'm gonna take the opportunity with YouTube here since I have the platform to make longer videos to kind of go into more of the nuance of this stuff because the reality is that there is no simple perfect way for everyone with PCOS to eat but there are some overarching things that we can do to kind of address each of these root causes. So the best approach in my opinion is to put together uh, different styles of diets and eating that actively help each root cause into like a kind of lifestyle plan. Now I've already done this work in a course of mine that you're welcome to check out if this is like interesting to you. It's called PCOS Foundations. It's a four week. It comes with uh, meal plans, grocery lists. It's all self-paced, but it has a lot of lectures and things for me in this style um, where I'm talking about, you know, how exactly to implement a PCOS friendly diet that manages all the root causes. And I think it's, my intention with it was to create a resource for people who are new new to PCOS nutrition or who were new to having a moderated take on PCOS nutrition because so many of us have, you know, gone off the deep end with nutrition before and we've, you know, gone full carnivore or keto or, you know, back in the day and just haven't found like that sustainable middle ground yet. So that was, this course was sort of my answer to that. So you're welcome to check that out if you want to. I'll, I'll link it in the show notes. But what I will do here on YouTube is hopefully go into some more on each of the root causes by themselves and some like nutrition recommendations for them that might be helpful. So stay tuned for that. You can also take the root cause quiz uh, on my website. You have to sign up for my newsletter to get it, but it's a, it's a free quiz that goes into the different symptoms of the root causes and kind of gives you a percentage to tell you like, okay, I'm 60% insulin resistant, 40% inflammation or what have you. It's just a fun little thing. Of course, it's not diagnostic, but I have found that it, it does line up pretty well with, with what I would actually like want to work on with a client. So it's interesting. So you can take that. I'll link that as well below. And don't be afraid to subscribe, like the video, leave me a comment, let me know. And um, I'll be back soon with more videos. I hope this was helpful. Have a great day. Bye.